I'm Andrew Brilliant. I'm an aerodynamicist. I live in Yokohama, Japan. I'm from the United States. I've done everything from Super GT championship winning aerodynamic design work, um, design, built and installed the wind tunnel at Nissan Technical Center, all the way down to like um, doing amateur cars, including my own and like this car. And that's something between a hobby and, and a passion for me. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is always regulations. Um, and the regulations will be derived from a lot of things, usually trying to contain aerodynamic performance. Um, it just has such a strong effect on the overall performance of the cars. And so, and also there's a lot of um, marketing reasons for, for that. You know, for example, if we're designing a GT car, it's typically funded by a manufacturer. Um, so usually they, it's kind of like a race on Sunday, sell on Monday sort of thing. So we'll have a whole bunch of rules that are set out by the marketing department about how the car needs to appear. The two most common will be that um, tied to a production vehicle or uh, controlling performance. Typically in a manufacturer project, it'll be a combination of wind tunnel and CFD. Do a lot of conceptual work in CFD and a lot of fine detail work will move to the wind tunnel. It's never the same twice. I mean, there are a few things that you know are going to work like that you've never seen fail. You know, do, you do 100 cars, it works 100 times. Um, there are very few things like that. Almost everything else, you will be su constantly surprised by when it doesn't work and why. And it's just, I mean, it's just a limitation. Like, you, human mind can't visualize the flow of air. And if you really could do that, you'd be a really rich man. You know, because why would you need a $30 million wind tunnel or a, you know, supercomputer that costs tens of millions, like, if you could just guess, right? So that's what we do um, is not as much about what shape we make as it is about how we come up with the shape and what processes we live by to, to define that shape and how we let the results of testing guide our future tests and um, what we learn from past tests to help us do that more efficiently in the future. Um, I, would say, I would say the concept that there is like an ultimate perfect shape and you just need to know what it is, that it's not individual depending on so many factors to the car. Um, I would say another misconception is, you know, that not understanding that aero is a developmental process or that every year that your new idea outperforms the old one and that it's constantly evolving. It's not just something that you have to do that. And there's a lot of like small misconceptions, you know, but like things that people think work at, you know, like aerodynamicists will just kind of shake their heads at, but, it, but everyone had to learn somehow, so. Um, aerodynamic freedom. Um, there, like I was saying about how what we do, um, what we learn from our tests is what guides our future tests. And, and I wanted to learn about and understand these concepts that um, were essentially banned in you know, all these motorsports because of the effect that they had. And um, it's a combination of wanting to learn about that. Um, I also wanted to go through an entire build process end to end on my own. And because it, it, I think it makes me better at what I do to understand all of the phases of manufacturing and managing a team in that. So um, I couldn't do that in amateur motorsports without the car being very limited by regulations anywhere else. And I've had to learn how to develop a reliable gearbox or how to develop a high horsepower engine. And inside of any kind of a manufacturer pro project, you're so compartmentalized, you never get exposed to all those different facets of a build or um, understand those concepts that are banned. So, and I think every engineer sort of always dreams about what is the ultimate thing that you could build, right? Like if you didn't have this, regula if there were no regulations, how fast would a Formula One car go? I'd like to know that, right? And I think a lot of people would, but they're never really gonna let that happen, right? So, so you do something like this time attack and you get to learn ab about maybe where the edge is a little bit more, but the compromise is you're doing it with like no money. So, you know, it's, it's a learning experience. And, and that's why I have a passion for motorsport is because I like to learn, so. Well, optimum's hard to define, I guess, but um, to me, optimum is faster than you were yesterday, I guess. You know, you might have to go through a few, like you can throw stuff on there and try it, and you can, you're basically mimicking the same testing process that we do, right? But you have to install them and build them in full scale, which is obviously more risky and expensive, potentially. <laughs> and maybe in the early years of Time Attack, it was like just having a splitter on was, now you're winning, right, where you weren't before. But now everyone's got that, right? Everyone's sort of applied the common sense ideas and now it's to the point where the people who are really excelling 
they're you know hiring specialists in developing aerodynamics and developing aerodynamics or suspension or engine or whatever and so it just it's just a level of competition i think really defines what level you have to be at with it you know and i think we've moved beyond that now it's um you'd have to be really lucky to to just guess at it and do better than someone who's been racing for a couple of years or I would, I mean, I would say that in the last five years, it's probably been the major factor. I mean, if you look at the basic parameters of the, the car, the, the uh, weight of the car, the horsepower, I mean, it's changed. Um, it's changed a little bit, but it hasn't changed like, you know, five or eight seconds, but the cars are five or eight seconds faster. And I think that I would say, in my opinion, the bulk of that is aerodynamic. That's been where they saw the most change. Yeah, yeah, I mean, a, a typical time attack team will fall somewhere in the, two to fifteen thousand dollars sort of budget range um, and that's depending on how much CFD they they do I've never had a time attack team have a wind tunnel budget this hasn't happened you know I mean just the model would be as much as some of these cars cost to build in the end so um, yeah typically like that two to fifteen thousand and um, you know starting with like a, what I call best practices and just kind of going over the car and teaching them about aero and improving the car up to you know designing a car from scratch all in CFD you know uh, CAD model scan the car that whole thing that's the fifteen thousand top end um, yeah so I mean so so basically I'll come and I'll spend two days with the team and um, go over the car and learn about the packaging and the most important thing probably is understanding who's building it and how um, because each package is really custom tailored to that like there's a shape that might be out of budget for this one construction method it just not makes sense to do that way and um, I really tailor it to each team, and typically the results, depending on what class they're in, what sort of tires, power, all the details of the car that we have to work out, um, it'll be between three to five seconds a lot, roughly. I've done so many of these cars now, and every time I do it, I learn from, you know, the customers learn from me and I learn from the customers, and people are very ingenious, especially when they don't have money, to figure out how to build this stuff, and so I've just sort of collected this knowledge about how to build the shapes that I've designed and I've started, the biggest mind shift I had to do with Time Attack was learning how to construct everything cheap because I came at it with GT car construction methods and all that changed. And so a lot of times for my customers, you know, if they started with a package like that, it, it wouldn't be rare at all to say that we were able to save enough money on the way that they thought they were going to construct it, that they it wouldn't have cost them money to consult me. And I get that feedback a lot from customers. The thing I always look forward to the most is the initial driver feedback after they go from having like mild or no aero to having it on the car and uh, you know just you know breaking so much deeper and the driver trying to wrap their head around the grip. So that's that's probably what I'll be looking forward to the most. Probably the two most difficult and most important things that I'll work out on in like a two-day project will be the cooling system packaging and uh, like front diffuser stuff. That's those are always very specific to each car, um, what you can fit there, because even if, even if it's the same car, they won't have the same cooling requirements, the same layout of the, like a turbocharger or a radiator, and all that stuff's so different. Um, and, and the front diffuser thing is, really depends a lot on um, budget, uh, how much space there is in the packaging in the front of the car. Um, you know, there's, I've never had a team do it the same way twice. I, I don't know why, but this, this is kind of how it comes out. Uh, well, because it's a, it's a third of the drag um, to start with of the, of the car, roughly a third. Um, and then it's also probably the, the easiest thing to screw up, I guess. And you can, if you do it wrong, you can make it so the rest of the aero package just doesn't work. Like if you don't control that air, it will go exactly to where you don't want it to. You know, because it's just like water runs downhill, right? You try to make downforce somewhere, you make low pressure. Well, you've got, you know, air pouring out of a radiator. And so where is it going to go? It's going to go to the low pressure place and right off everything else. So, um, and uh, with time attack cars, especially why it's difficult is because um, the front end packaging is so limited um, because most of them are front engine cars and, you know, just everything's packed into one part of the car, right? And that's also the part of the car that's the heaviest and needs the most downforce. So it's really concentrated around there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a set of tires, right? So if you think about what, how much lap time do you get from running a set of tires twice instead of like buying a new one, it's a similar price. And there's no way it's in the neighborhood of, of the kind of lap time that I've seen. I've, I haven't seen less than three seconds to date. So that's, uh, you know, I think that the, the cost performance is certainly there. 
especially once you have even the basics on the car. I think it's definitely the way to go. And also you get a, a greater reward out of it the earlier you integrate it because the earlier in the de development of the car that you start thinking about aero, then you can build the car around the aero instead of making it an afterthought. And then you're stuck with the packaging that you have. And so I, I think it pays a lot of dividends to, to do it and do it early. Oh, I, I love it. That's why I do it, right? So it's, um, it's very rewarding. And that's, and that's a rare feeling um, because you can be sort of solely responsible for that. Um, and compared to like in a motorsport environment where you might be like one of, you know, six aerodynamicists. And even though it's a more aggressive project or a larger budget project, I, I really enjoy that feedback that I'll get from, from a time attack team. And those people have just poured their heart and soul into it. And they're so happy when it makes a big jump. Yeah, geez, uh, there's so many of them. I'm almost drawing a blank. But, um, you know, obviously, like in the US, um, I, I worked on the FX Motorsports NSX, and they ended up being the fastest um, time attack car in the US. Uh, let me thinking through the history. The first um, team that brought me here was actually GT Auto Garage when they were doing the R35 GTR, and they were competing with um, uh, Mercury Motorsports just, just up the road. And I actually did Nemo at the same time. So that was, so Nemo would have been the third time attack car I ever did, and that was, you know, some, uh, what is that, uh, four years ago. I did some work for Adam Newton. He had a 32 GTR in uh, Victoria. I did a lot of, like, small stuff for teams, Simon Petaluski. Um, I just kind of, you know, he bounced ideas off of me for his car. Yeah, yeah, so, um, yeah, it'll be at this year's event for sure. Um, I think people are familiar with the car now. They've seen it enough times. And uh, GT Auto Garage is, is taking care of the maintenance and run. You know, our development's pretty simple for this year, like run reliably. Um, and then we have an aero upgrade package for this year as well. It's, it's going to be a fundamental game changer, I think. And I, I think it will, be a, it will be the highest downforce car that has ever been produced in the history of the world, and I'm pretty confident about that. Although we can't give away Andrew's secrets and IP, we can tell you this. Two days spent with him was a real eye-opener and a huge learning experience. Some of the aero mods we had were on the right path, but Andrew has helped us develop our concepts even further and our list of aero mods to do went from five or six to more like 20. One surprising aspect is that Andrew knows what it's like to work on a limited budget and how to work with what we have. Capitalising on Chris's welding and fabrication skills meaning much of our aero will make use of what we already have and be made of aluminium, which is quite often lighter and easier to work with than fiberglass, and even better, it can be easily modified or repaired. We didn't muck around and started some of the aero work straight away so the shell could leave for paint after the weekend. We're going to be blocking off all the vents in the front bar except for the central opening which is where we needed to make a duct to guide air to the intercooler and the new PWR combined radiator and oil cooler we have coming. Our old side skirt and front guard design was very messy, but had the right idea. We decided to cut the guard in half and fabricate a new lower section that is not only neater and cleaner, but also designed to help air escape the wheel arch. The side skirts were also trimmed back to match the vertical fences we already had making them neater and more effective. There is much more aero work to go, but we'll be covering this in a later issue of Motive Garage.